6. Landing Helicopters on Aircraft Carriers Landing a helicopter on an aircraft carrier is more difficult than landing on solid ground, especially in bad weather and at night. In fact, it's considered to be one of the most challenging and complex tasks required of Navy pilots. But these landings occur regularly and are carried out by experienced pilots with the use of advanced landing systems and technologies. One system, known as the Aviation Recovery System, guides the pilot to the landing spot using a series of lights and mirrors on the carrier deck. Choppers are also set up with communication equipment and radar systems, which ensure that they can interact effectively with crew members on the aircraft carrier who are assisting with the landing. During their training, pilots practice landing helicopters on the carrier deck in all types of conditions to ensure that they're qualified to do the job even in the most challenging of circumstances. In a Quora post, former military pilot Chuck Hunter wrote that during bad weather, the person navigating a chopper will know to look for the ship directly beneath the storm. He further explained that carriers turn into the wind when they launch and recover aircraft, and that the storm will be in the same direction that the wind is coming from. In another Quora post, former Navy pilot Stephen Fritz recalled a time when he landed a helicopter aboard the USS Wasp in dense fog with almost no visibility. He was running extremely low on fuel and knew that he wouldn't get a second chance to execute the landing if he missed on the first try. And as Fritz approached the carrier, he descended until he could see the water below. Meanwhile, a crew member began dropping smoke flares into the water off the ship's stern and leading the USS Wasp up to the landing area. Fritz followed the trail of flares until he knew he was near the flight deck. He climbed until he knew he was above it, then carefully lowered the helicopter onto the deck. He only knew for sure that the landing would be a success when he descended beneath the fog and saw that he was in the right place. In September 2023, the U.S. Navy announced that it's working with engineers from Texas A&M University to develop a fully autonomous vertical takeoff and landing VTOL, aircraft using software meant to mimic a pilot's landing behavior. They hope to come up with a system that will work even in the most challenging situations, including in rough winds and while a ship is changing course. 5. Controlled Crash Landings Nicknamed the Dragon Lady, the Lockheed U-2 spy plane was developed during the 1950s for the purpose of discreetly monitoring Soviet activities. The single-seat, single-engine aircraft was shrouded in secrecy during its early years of operation. But eventually, it became known for its reliability as a high-altitude intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance plane. Despite its exceptional performance, the U-2 has some shortcomings. At 63 feet long and with a wingspan of 105 feet, its glider-like dimensions and shape help the plane fly long ranges at high altitudes. But this also makes the vehicle difficult to fly. The U-2 has a high stall speed relative to its maximum speed. Its early pilots had to fly at a very specific speed in order to avoid both stalling and high-speed buffering which causes the aircraft to shake and vibrate. Pilots also had a narrow 7 mile per hour margin that they had to stay within. The plane is challenging to land due to limited cockpit visibility, unusual bicycle landing gear, and its wings which make it want to stay airborne. And by the time a pilot reaches the end of a flight, they're usually rather tired, which only makes it more difficult to land. Touching down safely requires the assistance of a high-performance chase car, which follows the U-2 at speeds of up to 140 miles per hour as it descends to the runway. Person driving the chase car radios the plane's altitude and airspeed to the pilot right before the aircraft hits the pavement. Then, after landing, the pilot keeps the plane as straight as possible until it inevitably falls off balance causing one of the wings to tip to the ground. To avoid damaging the aircraft, the undersides of both wings are equipped with titanium skid plates. A ground crew then rushes in and attaches wheeled pogo supports into the wings, enabling the U-2 to taxi back to the hangar. 4. The F-104 Widowmaker Developed for the U.S. Air Force during the 1950s, the Lockheed F-104 Starfighter Supersonic Fighter Bomber was the first combat aircraft capable of sustained Mach 2 flight. It was designed to be simple, fast, and lightweight, yet powerful. 
and was capable of climbing to an altitude of 48,000 feet in just 60 seconds. But the F-104 proved to be problematic right from the beginning. It was extremely sensitive to control inputs and was therefore very easy for pilots to lose control of. And in the words of one pilot, if you push the boundaries just a bit too much, you lost control. It's also believed that many pilots struggled with the highly sophisticated jet because they'd never flown any aircraft like it, and the ground crews were equally inexperienced when it came to maintaining the supersonic aircraft. The Air Force only used the Starfighter for a handful of years, but Lockheed officials persuaded foreign officials to buy the aircraft in a scandal. And this scandal would eventually inspire Congress to pass a new federal anti-corruption law called the Foreign Corruption Practices Act. During the late 1960s, Germany bought 916 Starfighters. Nearly 300 of the planes were involved in accidents over the aircraft's 31-year career with the country's military resulting in the deaths of 115 pilots and earning the Starfighter the nickname of the Widowmaker. Lockheed refused to admit any liability in court, but paid a large settlement to widows of pilots who died in Starfighter crashes. The Belgian Air Force lost nearly half of its 100 Starfighters over a 20-year period starting in 1963, while Italy lost 138 of its 368 plane fleet. In Canada, where the Starfighter was nicknamed the Aluminum Death Tube, 110 of the military's 238 F-104s were lost over a 25-year period. The Starfighter's accident rate varied among users and the operating conditions they were faced with. Some countries had much lower accident rates, with Spain boasting a perfect safety record and no losses among its F-104 fleet over a seven-year period. But the Starfighter's overall accident rate was disproportionately high compared to other fighter jets. Many losses were for fairly conventional reasons, including bird strikes, damage from other foreign objects, lightning strikes, mid-air collisions with other planes, and pilot disorientation. But the F-104 was notoriously difficult to fly, and accidents continued even after design flaws were remedied. In addition to being known as the Widowmaker and the Metal Death Tube, it earned the nicknames of the Flying Coffin and Death Dart. 3. The Wobblin Goblin Developed during the early 1980s, the Lockheed F-117 Nighthawk was the first operational aircraft to be designed with stealth technology. It was built by Lockheed's Secretive Advanced Development Program, ADP Division, better known by the nickname Skunk Works. Known as a black project, the F-117 was kept secret from even some of the most top-ranking Pentagon officials. The F-117 is coated in a radar-absorbent material. Its distinctive shape was designed to deflect radar, but it made the aircraft aerodynamically unstable, earning it the nickname of the Wobblin Goblin. It was especially prone to instability at low speeds and during aerial refueling. The plane was notoriously difficult to keep in the air and required a complex fly-by-wire system just to get it off the ground. It was also impossible to fly without computerized controls. Despite these issues, though, the F-117 was considered groundbreaking for its stealth capabilities. And in addition to having a sophisticated fly-by-wire system, it was equipped with advanced navigation and attack systems, as well as an automated planning system which could release weapons and perform virtually all the functions of an attack mission. The government went out of its way to prevent the public from discovering the aircraft. When an F-117 pilot fatally crashed in the Sequoia National Forest in 1986, authorities quickly guarded off the area and imposed a strict media blackout. The Air Force restricted the airspace above the wreck and had a helicopter circle overhead to ensure that nobody could even try to get close enough to know what was going on. Firefighters were denied entry to the site, even though the wreck was on fire. Then, the F-117 debris was cleared away and replaced with the staged wreck of a different aircraft. Government officials finally publicly acknowledged the existence of the F-117 in 1988, after a grainy photograph of its silhouette in the night sky was revealed during a Pentagon press conference. 
It made its first public appearance in 1989, and that same year, the aircraft saw combat for the first time during the U.S. invasion of Panama, also known as Operation Just Cause. And in addition, it was used in the Gulf War, the Kosovo War, and the U.S. military actions in Afghanistan and Iraq. While some experts would eventually argue that the F-117's capabilities were overstated, it has a largely successful track record. During Operation Desert Storm, the aircraft flew around 1,200 enemy attacks over Iraq, all while striking thousands of heavily defended targets with no losses. The F-117 was retired in 2008 following the introduction of the F-22 Raptor. Some of the aircraft have been kept in airworthy condition in the years since, and have occasionally been seen flying near military bases. 2. Extreme Multitasking in the Apache AH-64 The U.S. military uses some of the world's most advanced helicopters, and included among them is the Boeing AH-64 Apache Attack Helicopter, which was developed during the 1970s for the American Army. Designed to withstand hits from 23mm rounds and with rotors that are capable of continuing to operate after sustaining enemy damage, this armored, flying tank is considered one of the deadliest fighting machines ever built. Most military aircraft are difficult to fly, and the AH-64 is no exception. In his memoir, Apache, former British Army Air Corps pilot Ed Macy wrote, that the chopper requires immense talent and skill to fly, stating in his own words, flying an Apache almost always meant both hands and feet doing four different things at once. He also added, even our eyes had to learn how to work independently of each other. Maisie described having to constantly look into a monocle using his right eye while dozens of instrument readings were projected into it. Additionally, unlike most military helicopters, the AH-64 can operate at sea, giving many of its pilots the added challenge of having to land it on an aircraft carrier. In 2020, the U.S. military announced that it was retiring hundreds of aging Apache AH-64 helicopters. But those that are still flightworthy are being upgraded to the Army's 64HE variant that are scheduled to remain in use until 2040. One. The F-22 Raptor – Sophistication at a Cost The Lockheed Martin F-22 Raptor stealth fighter jet is one of the world's most sophisticated aircraft of its kind. But it's also one of the most complicated, due to its advanced avionics and stealth capabilities. Developed for the U.S. Air Force during the late 1990s and early 2000s, the F-22 has been praised as setting the benchmark for its generation of combat aviation. In many ways, its advanced features make the pilot's job easier, but there are some major drawbacks to the F-22. For one, it's an expensive aircraft, coming at a price tag of $334 million each. Maintenance is both costly and labor-intensive, leaving roughly half the Air Force's 180-plane fleet grounded at any given time. Each pre-flight check takes hours and consists of a laundry list of tasks including checking all of the plane's avionics and other systems, checking the LCD displays, tightening bolts, and checking panel installation. Additionally, there are two cockpit checks, and the final step is making sure the runway is free of foreign objects. While any pre-flight check is extensive, the F-22 reportedly takes it to a whole new level. The aircraft has a troubling history of pilots experiencing an unexplained loss of oxygen, causing them to fall unconscious and experience other hypoxia-like symptoms. In 2010, Air Force Captain Jeff Haney died during an F-22 training flight out of Alaska when his oxygen system shut down completely. Following a year-long investigation, the Air Force blamed Haney for his own death claiming that distraction caused the fatal malfunction. Only the best pilots are allowed to fly the F-22 Raptor after outcompeting other skilled candidates for the role. So it didn't make much sense to think that Haney succumbed to distraction after undergoing the Air Force's rigorous testing requirements. The military's narrative about Haney's death was called into question when other pilots publicly came forward with similar stories of experiencing oxygen problems while flying the F-22. The Department of Defense reviewed the report and concluded that the Air Force lacked enough evidence to blame the tragedy on pilot error. 
Haney's sister, Jennifer, told MLive.com that she blamed the F-22 for the loss of her brother. She accused the Air Force of refusing to take responsibility because it would mean admitting that the F-22 had malfunctioned. In a statement to ABC News, the fallen pilot's widow, Anna, said that her husband's death showed that the F-22 wasn't ready to serve the United States. In 2012, the Pentagon announced that a faulty valve had been identified as the source of the problem. The government reassured the public that the issue had been resolved. And in 2020, the military announced that it was implementing further protections to ensure that the F-22 is safe to fly. Would you ever try and fly one of these helicopters yourself? Let us know if you would in the comments down below. And if you enjoyed this video, be sure to leave a like and subscribe to the channel. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you in the next one. Bye.